Hello, uh, welcome to the fifth module of uh, the course on power quality. So this is uh, Professor Umar Rao bringing you the lectures on, on power quality under the e Sikshana program of VTU. So we have covered all the major power quality disturbances in the last uh, uh, four modules. Now this fifth module is all about benchmarking. And uh, it includes the estimation of power quality. Estimation means I have some data, past data, present data. With it, I estimate some values which of which I don't have measurements. And uh, we will see how power quality has to be included in planning of the distribution system. And uh, today we have a lot of distributed generation. That means small generation spread in the distribution side. Earlier, you know, generation, transmission, distribution were clearly demanded. But with the advent of renewable energy, we have generation, that is we have sources on the distribution side. So what are the popular technologies for this? And how do we interface to the utility and what are the major power quality issues and uh, interconnection standards or what we'll be studying in this module. So first, what is benchmarking? You know, we are very used to hearing the phrase, this is the benchmark, right? So if you take Olympics, somebody has set the goal, uh, set the benchmark standard for 100 meters. So if you take racing, there is a benchmark. So if you uh, take phones, you know, we say the ultimate phone, the benchmark, whatever it is, I compare it with maybe iPhone or with OnePlus and so on. So basically, uh, benchmarking is done with almost all products and services, right? So what is benchmarking? So when it comes to a company, the benchmarking is measuring the performance. It could be of a product, right? Of a laptop, a mobile. It could be of a service, your hospital, your banking, your postal services, your internet. So we say, no, this service provider is not good. So I change my service provider. So there you're benchmarking. You're having a standard for the service processes against those of another business, similar business, considered to be the best in the industry. This best could be a perception in your mind or it could be defined also by the industry. For example, if you take phones, okay, somebody will say it is the best, they will have some uh, parameters, but for you something else could be a, a better standard. So essentially what is benchmark is, I have something which I feel is good. Or somebody else has told that this is the best till now. Now I have a company with a similar product, a service or a process. And so I have to say whether it is as good as that or better than that. That's the meaning of uh, benchmarking. So the idea of benchmarking is to improve quality. Okay. So you set a target, 100 meters. Somebody has uh, covered it in nine seconds. So you, that, is a, that is a standard. Now you want to improve it. So the next runner will try to see that it is improved. So benchmarking provides um, excellent opportunity uh, to improve internally. And in power quality, benchmarking forms uh, an important aspect of the overall structure of the power quality program. So to define benchmarking that this is standard, I need to define some metrics. For example, if it's a running race, the time will be the metrics, right? If it's a mobile phone, it could be the ease of operation, it could be the quality of your camera, and so on. And we have different standards for different things. You say, as far as camera is concerned, nothing could be uh, uh, one plus. You may say, and you may say for the look of it, nothing to beat an Apple iPhone. So you may have different standards, different benchmarks for different parameters. 
So I have to first define the metric. Okay. So the every reliability benchmarking methodology project. So um, TR107938 in uh, Palo Alto, California, they defined a set of PQ indices, some index. So that served as a metric for uh, quantifying the quality of service. Can you think of some metrics we can define? For example, I can, I can say, uh, you know, uh, you remember in the first module, we saw the concepts of reliability. So I can say that if you have less than one minute of outage in a year, then you can say that quality is extremely good. So that is a metric. That is a metric. Or I can say, if you don't experience more than 10 sites in a year, then it is very good. So these in indices, I have to define. These indices, we have to define. Look, make a comparison. Make a comparison. Whether your service is good or bad. Here it is a service. Because when I give, when, when the utility gives us the power supply, it's a service they are doing. So we are actually trying to benchmark the service provided by the utilities. Okay. So how do I calculate the metrics for that? I need measurement. So another important aspect of benchmarking is measurement. What do I measure? How do I measure? How accurate are my uh, instruments which I use for measuring? Supposing you, you keep the time as the limit, okay, time as the uh, metric, then I need to have an excellent uh, time measuring instrument. I can't use an ordinary watch which may not be, because yeah, we, are, we are talking of milliseconds range. So the measuring should be very accurate. Clear? So let us decide and conclude that benchmarking is a process by which an industry sets a standard for a product, a process or a service against which a similar vendor can make a comparison. So the two important aspects here is one is defining metrics for comparison and secondly, the measurements to be made to compute or calculate the metrics. So why do we need uh, benchmarking for power quality? So the first one is I need to define the quality of supply. The customer has to know whether the power supply provided to them is of good quality or not. Secondly, in the power system, my disturbances are not restricted to local boundaries. You have seen the disturbance will percolate in the grid. So some industry turns on an induction furnace and your capacitor fails. Okay. So somewhere a lightning strikes and that surge may travel and affect your equipment. So I can, it's very difficult to define a boundary. I can't define it because it's a network and the problems, faults can percolate. And I really need to identify in the long run how to improve the quality because we are having more and more sensitive equipment. And I discussed at length in module one how the load profile has changed entirely with the modern equipment. So we need to identify spaces in which we can improve. Next, I also need to decide whether I'm the utility or the consumer, what is the compatibility between the supply and my equipment? Let us say I'm not getting a very good quality of supply and my equipment is very sensitive, then they're not compatible. Clear? And of course, the final objective is to standardize the indices. Let us have a standard. Let all of us define in similar manner. So these are all some of the reasons why benchmarking is necessary. So now let us see what are the steps involved in benchmarking. So the first one is select the benchmarking metrics. So the EPRI project, they have defined some standard metrics and we can use them for benchmarking. The next is I have to collect the power quality data, right? Because I want to know whether my quality is comparable with the benchmark. So this would involve very good sensors, measuring equipment, also communication. I may have a very good instrument 
the data collected may be very good, but I don't have a means of extracting the data. So all these are very important when it comes to collection of power quality data. For how long should I collect the data? Should I collect the data for one day or one month or one year? Okay. So it will it'll be very labor intensive because we'll have a lot of uh, data to be uh, collected. So people are trying now to automate, automatically create a database because we have very good uh, uh, ICT, that is internet and communication technologies today, information and communication technologies. And using these technologies, we can automate a lot of data collection process. Then the third is I have to select the benchmark. Which benchmark do I want to compare it with? See, I can't, my budget cannot be 5,000 for a mobile and I can't compare that with iPhone. iPhone cannot be my benchmark. iPhone costs about 1 lakh and my budget for a mobile phone is only 5,000. So I can't use that benchmark. I have to select the correct benchmark. Clear? So there are some standards, organizations such as IEEE, IEC, ANSI, NEMA, etc. So these people, we can compare with the standards set by these organizations for the benchmarking. And I want to define the target performance level. See, always 100% accuracy, 100% reliability, 0% error. These are all not practically feasible. Okay, in most of the cases, they are not practically feasible. So I set a feasible and a practical target. And I can't set a very low target also because I'm not confident of the quality. That is bad. That's a bad practice. Okay. So we have to set uh, targets that are appropriate and economically feasible. Please realize quality costs money. And up to around 90, 95%, it's fine. But if you want to achieve from 95 to 100%, it is the cost will go exponentially because your accuracy, your sensitivity, then your equipment, everything have to be ultra good. So we have to set the target based on not only the budget, economic constraints, but who are the consumers we are uh, trying to uh, address, etc. Clear? So these are the four steps of benchmarking. First, define the metrics, then collect the data, and select the benchmark which is appropriate uh, to you, determine your target performance level, and then you make a comparison. So the first step we saw was how to define the metrics, definition of metrics. So every defined indices for short duration RMS voltage variations, that is, Sag, swell, and interruptions. So we know all these last for less than one minute. If it's more than one minute, it will become under voltage, over voltage, and a blackout. The second one is harmonic distortion. And the third is transient over voltages. This is mainly because of capacitor switching and also because of wiring. So we will see what this is. And steady state voltage variations like phase balance, unbalance, whether any unbalance is there between the three phases, and uh, flicker. So in flicker, we saw that your voltage is within the band. That means the regulation is good, but the change is rapid. So the rapid voltage variations. So these are all some parameters for which metrics have been defined. So first, let us take the characterization of RMS so RMS we know group means square. So you have a window and you calculate what is the RMS value of the signal in that window. Clear? Yeah. Now, one possibility is I take a cycle. Let us take voltage. I take a cycle. So I sample, we have to do sampling. So I sample and I use the formula for RMS value. Supposing it's voltage, V1, supposing I take n samples in a cycle, V1 squared plus V2 squared, etc., plus Vn squared divided by n squared, root of mean of the squares. 
root square root of the mean of the squares. That's the way we calculate the digital meters. It's clear? So I take one cycle, I sample, calculate the RMS value, then I discard it. So let us say I, I take 80 samples, 80 samples per cycle. So I take 80 samples per cycle, calculate the RMS value. I discard these 80 samples. Next cycle, I, I again take 80 samples and then calculate the RFS value, right? Now here, I can figure out the RMS value in one cycle if there is any deviation. But I have to wait for one full cycle before I know whether there is a sag or not, or a swell. Are you getting the point? So supposing, supposing the sag starts occurring at the beginning of the second cycle, that is when I, when I just take the third sample of the second cycle. But I am calculating the RMS value when after I take all the samples of the second value, second cycle. So I will not know till the end of the second cycle whether a sag or a swell has occurred. Clear? So this is one way of doing it. The other way is I take 80 samples from the first cycle, right? Then the 81st sample, the 81st sample is same as the first sample in the first cycle, right? Because if it is symmetrical, if, if there is no deviation, then all the first samples in every cycle, all the six, sixth samples in every cycle, all the nth sample in every cycle, they will all have the same instantaneous values. So I take 80, 80 samples from the first cycle. And when the 81st sample comes, I discard the first sample. And if there is no deviation, then the RMS value still sh should remain the same because the 81st value and the first value will be the same. But if a sag has occurred at this instant, then my RMS value will change. So what I do is, instead of taking the window cycle by cycle and then calculating RMS, I can just have a moving window. So as soon as a fresh uh, data arrives, discard the last one and keep calculating the RMS. So with this, you can detect the sag or the swell, any event as soon as it occurs, because you're not waiting till the end of the cycle for all the samples to. Okay, so, RMS events are very useful. We have seen we define SAGs, well, all of them through RMS values. So th there are three levels in which this RMS uh, events are characterized. The first is called as the phase or component event. The second is called as the measurement event. And the third is called as the aggregate event. So let's see what this is. So component event means Look at this curve which I have shown, right? So 100% voltage is the nominal voltage. Now, at around point here, somewhere around point 0.2 seconds, there is a swell. This swell goes up to 140%, remains for some time. And then there is a sag. So this sag voltage is around 30. It remains there. And then it comes down to zero and then it slowly recovers to 100. So if you look at the duration of the disturbance, that is from around 0.2 to 1.6 seconds, if you look at that window, there are many components of disturbance. That means there is a sag and there are swells of different uh, values and so on. So this is the meaning of a component event. That means there are many components of deviations. In the, in, in the event. So if I just say a sag, let us say a sag of magnitude 10% occurred for uh, 0.2 seconds, it, it does not characterize this completely because there are many components. So I cannot use a single magnitude duration pair to completely define what has happened. I need multiple. Okay. So when there are many components, We'll see how it is defined. So how do I define the magnitude? So if I want to specify this, how do I define the magnitude? So the sag is 100% because it has come to zero. So, and the swell is 40%, clear? So when you report the magnitude, 
with multiple components. You must report the maximum deviation from the normal voltage, whether it is sag or swell. So magnitude I can define, but what about the duration? I can't define the duration correctly because different levels have lasted for different times. So we specify by a method called as specified voltage method. That means some standard deviations are considered and we characterize the deviation for that standard value, how much, how long it lasts. For a SAG, for example, the voltage levels defined are 80, 50 and 10. Okay, 80%, 50% and 10%. That means when these are the thresholds. So when does the voltage fall below 80%? That is one characterization. For how long does it fall below 50%? For how long does it fall below 10%? So I characterize multiple components based on individual components. I characterize multiple components based on individual components. Clear? So, T80%, T is for time, is the duration of the event for which we are assessing when the magnitudes have fallen less than 80. How long has it been less than 80? How long has it been less than 50? How long has it been less than 10? Obviously, the higher ones will have more time. Because the duration, if you just look at this, see, look at this. If I draw a line at 80, then it that T is longer. But if I draw a line at 10, it will be shorter. Right? So with multiple magnitude duration pairs, we define the component level of deviations. This figure is very clear. You see, I have ma made the measurement, right? So let us say this, this is the swell and these are the sags. So T80% means when does it follow? So just draw a line at 80%. When does it, for how long does it last below 80%? T80%, T50%, and this is 10%. I draw a line. So this is T10%. Similarly, I can draw at 120 a line and get T120, T140. So we can define pairs. We can define pairs. Okay. Uh, next is the measurement event level. Here what happens in a three-phase system, the deviations may be different in different phases. The magnitude may be different, the duration may be different. So I have to, I have to very clearly define how it has affected all the three phases. So one way of doing it is you characterize each phase separately. You characterize each phase separately. The other way is use one set of characterization for all the three phases. So what is normally done is the second method is used. So out of the three phases, we determine in which phase the deviation was maximum and characterize that phase. So you're better off in the other two phases because anyway, the fault level at the other two phases is lesser. So at the measurement level, we characterize, instead of doing, doing separately for all the three phases, we take the phase where the duration and magnitude has been largest. The third is uh, aggregate level. So what this means is, let us say a fault occurs, a single line to ground fault occurs. This will cause overcurrent, not in just one, one of the uh, breakers. Many breakers may trip. So many of the relays may sense this. Re remember, relay is also a measuring uh, uh, unit. It can tell you how long the thresholds have been crossed if you know how many times the relay has tripped. So, you know, this overcurrent may be felt in many relays. So we try to aggregate all this into a single set of characters. Okay. So how, how does a particular fault characterize over an area 
instead of characterizing each of the local points where I have been monitoring using measuring instruments. So what is done is one way of aggregating the measurement is you take a window over one, one minute or 30 seconds after the first event has occurred. And then in that interval, you find out what is the maximum fault, which corresponds to the maybe the interruption or the sag or the swell. So this we can consider as the aggregated measurement value. So what this means is, let us say a fault occurs. Okay, fault occurs. And some five breakers trip. The five, five breakers trip. And three of the breakers on reclosing the fault is clear. But the other two still trip. So you find out which for, for which of the customers the tripping was largest, the duration of trip was largest. That would be the characterization of the fault. That would be the characterization of the fault. That is called as aggregating. When multiple customers are affected. So the RMS indices, there are many of them. We will only see some standard ones. One very popular RMS index is called as the System Average RMS Frequency Index. System Average RMS Frequency Index. And there is a suffix X here. So let us see, it is defined as sigma ni by nt. We will see what this is. X is the threshold value. X is the threshold value. So the standard threshold values defined are 140, 120, 110, 90, 80, 70, 50, 10. These are the standard values defined by every. And we know how to characterize this with the duration pair. How long is the voltage above 120? How long is the voltage below 80? And so on. So X is the threshold value. So we have uh, eight standard thresholds. Ni is the number of customers experiencing short duration voltage deviation with magnitudes above X percent. That is if it is swell, above 110, above 120, above 140 or below X. 90, 80, So X are these values. So when I'm characterizing swell, I have to see how many customers have above the X. And if I'm characterizing sag, how many have below? For example, if you have a single line to ground for, right? So some customers will experience a swell and some customers will experience a sag because single line to ground fault is an unsymmetrical fault. So it will increase the voltage um, in some phases and it will reduce the voltage in other phase. Okay, so you find out in that time how many customers had the voltage above 110, how many had above 120, how many had above 140, how many had below 90, 80, 70, 50, 10. So you can ask me, it will have the same effect on all the customers. No, because I have feeder lens. So as, as the customers tap power, the voltage is different at different points of tapping. So the effect of the quality will be different. If you're far away from the substation, your voltage drop will be more. If you're close to the substation, your voltage drop will be lesser. So we find and add all the customers. So Sigma Ni is done. Then NT is the total number of customers served. So a single fault may not affect all the customers. To some extent, it will be localized around its region. So this is a very, very popular index to find out how frequently uh, voltage deviations occur. So these thresholds are chosen as follows. Why the reason? So 140, 120, 110, these are all over voltage segments of the ITI curve. We had uh, done that, you know, CBMA and ITI curve. And 90, 80, 70 are the under voltage segments of the ITI curve. And 50, below 50% is typically when the motor contactors operate. So that is chosen uh, to see how many motors get affected because their contactors open. And 10 is the IEEE standard definition for interruption. If the voltage falls below 10, 
we say the supply is interrupted. So for these reasons, these eight different levels have been defined. Clear? But now you see these are all discrete. So if you say, for example, I have a threshold of 80 and then I have 70. So in between 80 and 70, right? How often has it fallen below 70? So if, if it is 65 or, uh, you know, if it is uh, 65 or 68, there is no difference because all of them will be in the same bracket. 65 is also less than 70. 68 is also uh, less than 70. Clear. So you can't make a very clear demarcation about the level. They will, they may, we only have thresholds. And we are only interested when the thresholds are crossed. Okay. And um, specific industry segments can find out they have a boundary. The CBMA curve, there is a boundary. The IPIC curve, there is a boundary. So those industries can just see how often the deviation falls outside the boundary. That, that could be one of the index. So now you cannot uh, monitor individually all the customers. I can't put one monitoring. That would be too, too expensive. And data handling will be a problem. So many millions of customers are there. We can't take the data from each. So we make an approximation about the voltage experience by each customer. So let's say there is a road or that there's a small roadside transformer feeding about 100 houses. So I can put one monitor there and then say that all the 100 houses, the deviation is similar. We can make that approximation. So what we do is the large area of the system we divided it into small segments. We divide it into small segments. Obviously, more segments. There is a smaller the area of the segment, better is the accuracy, but no problem. There is a limitation here, depending on how many monitors we can use, how many measuring instruments we can use. Now, what is the utility of these indices? So these indices can be computed at the substation levels at 132 KV, 66 KV substations, you can compute it and they can compare it with the standard values. And if a substation exhibits very poor performance, then they have to target improvement. It could be because of poor maintenance or it could be that some of the equipment have become very old and are not functioning properly. Clear? So the substation has to do an introspection and then find out what is the what is the problem for this poor performance and rectify. Thank you. So in the next class, we will see about other indices.